Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Rachel Bronson, President and CEO of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. And I am pleased today to be the moderator of today's program with former California Governor Jerry Brown and journalist Leslie Bloom. Governor Brown is also the executive chair of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and Ms. Bloom is the author of the new book, Fallout, the Hiroshima cover-up and the reporter who revealed it to the world. The program is part of the Commonwealth Club's virtual series, so let's start off by thanking members, donors, and supporters for making this and all other programs possible. I know the club is grateful for your support and hope others will follow your example to support the club during these very uncertain times. We also encourage you to submit questions via the chat room and I will turn to those and incorporate them into our conversations as the program unfolds. Right now, the bulletin's iconic doomsday clock is set at 100 seconds to midnight, the closest it's ever been over the nearly 75 years we've been setting it. It has been set as far away as 17 minutes to midnight and as close as 100 seconds, which is where we are today. This unnerving development speaks to the urgent relevance of Leslie's book, Fallout, and the need to reflect on the 75th anniversary of the bomb. The Hiroshima atomic bomb was the single most destructive event of the 20th century, killing more than 100,000 people and decimating an entire city. Leslie's book charts out why John Hersey decided to focus on six individuals and their experience in Hiroshima on the days of and immediately after August 6, 1945, why the New Yorker commissioned the study, how they got it out to the world, and how it became the scoop of the century, and how it affects how the understanding of the consequences of nuclear weapons today. It is a remarkable snapshot of New York's literary history and how it in entwined with politics and to allow journalists to do what journalists do best, which is to speak truth to power. Today's conversation comes as a current US administration considers resuming nuclear testing and commits to spending trillions of dollars to modernize nuclear, its nuclear arsenal as all other nuclear powers are doing today. It reminds us today and brings us to the present of the dangers of miscalculation and blunder and as those are growing amid tensions between the US, Russia, North Korea, China and Iran. We're pleased that Ms. Bloom and Governor Brown, a longtime advocate for dialogue around nuclear issues, are joining us for an important conversation about the legacy of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the prospects for reducing the nuclear threat. So Governor Ms. Bloom, welcome. Thank you. Leslie, let me start with you. Uh, Fallout is a fascinating and quirky book. It's a book about an article, but an article that you have pointed out was in many ways the scoop of the century. So why did you choose to write this book and why did you choose to write it now? Well, initially I, I came at the project, you know, as a journalist wanting to cover another journalist and, you know, to be blunt, you know, I've been dismayed and disgusted by the attacks on our, on our press over the last four and five years and designation of our, as our, of our press corps as, you know, quote unquote, enemies of the people. Um, and I knew that I wanted my next big nonfiction book to be a historical newsroom narrative, but one that really spoke to how the, the deadly importance of a free press and investigative reporting and, and not just upholding our democracy, but, you know, in a, you know, serving the common good and also holding the powerful to account. Um, I have an affinity academically for World War II topics, and I came across Hersey's story. And, and you know, the, the story of John Hersey has always been told in terms of how successful the story was in, you know, after the book came out and, you know, what an impact it made, but nobody had ever come at the story from how did he get this, how did he get the story in the first place? You know, in, in journalism world, the, 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 the saying goes, whoever controls the ground controls the story and the occupation forces were very much in control of the ground there. Um, and they, the story that they were controlling was the true story of the human toll and the, and the radioactive aftermath in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And John Hersey was able to get in, get that story out to the world. Um, and so for me, that um, narrative was one of the purest examples of the extreme importance of investigative journalism and why we have to, to fight to, to preserve and support it today. The nuclear 
aspect of the story became also significantly more important um, as as over the last four years, as uh, given the attitudes um, and actions of our current administration. And so the, the story just became increasingly and disturbingly relevant as I was researching and writing it. And I know you come from a literary family too. So the notion of writing about journalists seems pretty close to your heart as well. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my dad was uh, a, a, white, a writer and a producer for Walter Cronkite, among other greats. And, you know, Walter, when my dad was working for him in the 1960s, was considered the, the, the quote unquote, most trusted man in America. And, you know, I, so I, I take the designation of, you know, the press as the enemy of the people quite seriously. So this was, um, you know, intellectually and academically a big story for me, but also an extremely personal one. So um, let's kind of begin to move into the the the, the topic of, of nuclear weapons and nuclear war. And let's just, I was moved by the quote you started your book with, which seems to really um, organize the, the, the book that, that unfolds behind it. So you open with Hersey's quote that what has kept the world safe from the bomb since 1945 has been So what has Hersey contributed to our current understanding and why did you open with that quote in particular? Well, I mean, Hersey believed, believed that to be true. He believed that the memory of what happened at Hiroshima was, had been a significant deterrence um, and, and deterrent and was one of the reasons why, you know, there has been no subsequent nuclear attack following Nagasaki. I mean, Hersey was really the first person to get in on the ground um, uh, in, a, in a site of nuclear attack and show the world what, what nuclear attack really looked like when you were on the receiving end of it. The Japanese were not able to speak for themselves to any international audience until after the occupation. So, um, you know, obviously there have been many, many testimonies since um, about what it had been like to to uh, experience and survive, you know, the, the blasts and the aftermath. But Hersey's account really remains the international go-to source when people, um, when people read or, or, or trying trying to learn more about what it's like to be on the receiving end of nuclear warfare, in, in many ways we today still know what it is like to be on the receiving end of nuclear warfare because John Hersey showed us. So, Governor, let me bring you into this conversation and and start with uh, what I asked Leslie about: How important is the memory of Hiroshima to uh, keeping us safe today? And and how important is that as we're 75 years uh, from the dropping of the bombs and not and, and about that far from the actual publication of this article? Well, uh, the memory uh, of Hiroshima is the memory of, of the only time other than Nagasaki that the bomb has actually been dropped. And it's a memory now that uh, has been amplified uh, by all the maps that show uh, the uh, ground zero uh, depending upon the megatonnage and where the bomb, uh, how high the bomb is dropped, how many uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people uh, will die. So it's Hiroshima is the bedrock reality, and then all the elaboration since then. I, I will tell you that I do remember uh, where I was when I first heard about uh, the dropping of the atomic bomb. Uh, one of my uh, uh, neighbor, uh, young uh, guy, a year older than me, uh, ran across, it was across the street or something, he said, they just dropped the atomic bomb. And that was some, uh, that was important or big deal or something. But the idea, uh, the reality that we see in John Hershey's book and uh, uh, reframed uh, in Leslie, Leslie's book uh, was, was completely absent. Uh, the atomic bomb, it was an event, it was big, but it had no uh, blood and guts. It had no human sentiment. It had no... Um, a human face uh, that I could identify with. If someone could have told me the story uh, right then uh, when the bomb dropped, when I was, what, uh, seven and a half years old, uh, that would have been impactful. Uh, it was only years later that we began to understand this. So uh, even today, I would say uh, the vast majority of people are not thinking uh, about Hiroshima. They don't remember it. Uh, they're, they're, they are caught up in what I like to call the news of the day, all the activities. And these are important. Trump's tweets, 
um, the different uh, excitements that are, uh, you know, roiling the country. Uh, these are, you know, important and impactful and all that. But uh, the, the dropping of an atomic bomb is huge. And uh, just uh, today we read in the Washington Post about a $740 billion budget that Democrats and Republicans have all approved. So we have this crazy man in the White House called Trump, but then we have this chorus of uh, Republicans and Democrats that are cheerleading uh, this rush uh, to annihilation, what I call it, because we can't build these weapons up uh, for years and decades and not use them and not have them go off. So uh, uh, Hiroshima is the human face of this abstraction of these hundreds of billions that the Congress uh, just votes yay with, uh, I'm sure they must think about it, but they don't think about it like someone reading uh, Hershey's book and now uh, reading Leslie's book where you see uh, the horror uh, that is represented. And that horror uh, in its intensity is so far from the complacency, the sleepwalking, uh, the banality uh, of what is going on in the higher circles of the world and America. So uh, I think this is great that uh, the Commonwealth Club has chosen to talk about a topic that, if not taboo, is basically put in the category of non-interesting topics. This is uh, not, it's really not a big deal anymore. That's why I like to say, I don't like to say it, I, I, I say it with sadness, that the end of the world is not news. And hopefully uh, by now talking about the topic we are, we'll prevent that. Uh, but it is damn hard to break through uh, the news barrier that does not want to confront the horror that uh, the United States and these other eight countries are spending so much money to uh, augment, to foment, and to make ever ready to go off. I mean that, Somebody from Mars looking down would have to say, these are truly crazy people. So already we have some questions coming in from those listening. And I think um, we've just gotten one that uh, is direct. And, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great one to add in now. The, the question is, does our current administration take the use of nuclear weapons too lightly? And I want to frame that. Uh, I want to, That's a great question. But, but around that, if it, if it is taking it too lightly, what is the role of, of engaged citizenry to make sure that they don't take it too lightly? So it's kind of a two-part question, but I, um, both, this is what Hersey was responding to. Governor, I know this is what you're responding to. Leslie, I know you've been doing some thinking around whether or not we're taking this too lightly and why. So let me just put that out there. Maybe, Governor, I'll go to you, and then Leslie, I'll come to you um, for your thoughts on that as well. Is Does the administration take the use of nuclear weapons too lightly? And if so, what, what do we do about that? Uh, of course. Uh, to state that question is to answer it. Of course they take it too lightly. Uh, otherwise, um, uh, the administration would have torn up the Intermediate uh, Nuclear Forces Treaty. It wouldn't have torn up the Iran Treaty. And George Bush uh, wouldn't have torn up the... Uh, uh, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. I mean, we've been going down a path of stripping uh, America and the world from very, uh, you know, hard fought for treaties. So, yeah, they're all asleep. And even the ones that are a little awake, they're only awake for a few minutes a day or a week. Uh, relative to the threat, to the immediacy of a nuclear mistake, miscalculation or accident, they are totally uh, sleeping and not paying attention. And when I say they, I have to unfortunately say that the, the Democrats uh, are a little, you know, maybe some of them think about it or they say they think about it. But when it comes down to the money, uh, the House uh, Armed Services Committee just voted out this massive budget uh, with all this, with the, uh, uh, and they just granted all this money uh, to Northrop to build the, uh, build new ICBM. So look, uh, Washington is asleep. They are metaphorically on the Titanic, the Titanic, uh, the iceberg's up ahead. They don't see it. It's about to crash and their nice dinner party is going to be broken up. Actually, it's not a nice dinner party because they're all yelling at each other in Washington. Still, uh, this is 
the reality. Now, what do we do about it? Well, we talk about it. Uh, we, we write about it. Uh, we, we've got a long way to go. Uh, unless there's some kind of nuclear uh, close call, I guess people will stay asleep. It's very dangerous. Uh, and so I don't have a good answer for what do we do. We're doing it, but it is a fraction of what the citizens need to do if we're going to avoid the horror. And even saying that, I don't want to sound like Cassandra here, uh, uh, threatening and talking about the end of the world. It just happens that this is a horror that has been totally minimized uh, by the very urgent trivia of today's politics. I mean, look, when we're, when we're looking at the, this administration and the lightness with which it's, it's treating it, I mean, this is a president who has suggested that we lob a nuke into a hurricane. I mean, this is not taking you know, nuclear weaponry seriously. I mean, this is a president who has cavalierly mentioned that it could wipe out Afghanistan if it needed to with a nuclear weapon. This is an administration that makes, you know, regularly taunts, um, you know, a, 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 a North Korea with the most playground taunts possible. I mean, yes, absolutely. The administration is taking it too lightly. I agree with the governor's assessment that, uh, that uh, Washington is sleepwalking. My book came out four weeks ago and I've been speaking with um, many different groups of people, uh, many, in, in, and also uh, have done a lot of media for, you know, of different dispositions. And I have to say that, you know, as the governor mentions, it's nuclear, the nuclear landscape, which is more perilous than ever, is not on people's minds right now. And, you know, obviously we're dealing with multiple pandemics. We're dealing with, you know, the existential threat of COVID. We're dealing with existential threat of climate change and the bandwidth to stare down the fact that we are in a moment of, and have been, frankly, in a moment of existential threat for the last 75 years, but one that is, you know, it, again, more dangerous now than it has been at any other point since 1945. It doesn't seem like there is a, a bandwidth to take it on, um, but also it seems like there's an ignorance to how how dangerous a landscape that we're that we're in right now. But you know, the, the it's not good news. But the fact is is that we are in an election moment. And, you know, in 57 or 56 days, we are voting to elect a new president and, you know, new officials across, um, across the levels, um, across, across the country. And this needs to be, in my opinion, a, a much bigger issue in elections across the country and in the presidential election than it is. I mean, as, as uh, you know, the governor's assessment of the president's disposition towards nuclear, nuclear weapons is absolutely accurate. And I think, frankly, it should really terrify Americans and, and the world that this is the person who has his finger on the button. And it absolutely must be a bigger, a bigger uh, issue than it has been. It has to be a part of debate. It has to be a part of platforms. Um, and it not, not just, it, it needs to be a bigger, um, bigger issue for youth voters also, because they seem to have absolutely no sense that this is a real a real issue, and so that's um, you know if if it could be worked into to uh, campaigns and help us you know elect the more responsible leadership across the board, then I think that would be helpful to say the least. You know, I, this really uh, raises a, a real question about the current uh, state of our democracy. Uh, the, the humankind has invented these incredibly powerful weapons invented and designed incredibly complex systems of software, uh, digital systems that control these bombs from going off or being sent. Uh, mistakes can be made. They've been made uh, three times uh, at least uh, with Russia or the United States thinking that they've been attacked by hundreds of missiles. And it was just luck and in some degree of skill and fortitude uh, by the personnel that didn't pass it up the chain of command. Uh, today, if that went to Trump, who knows what he might do? Now, we don't know. Maybe he's going to be more uh, uh, concerned. All I can say is that the democracy is, uh, is unleashed all this uh, money and wealth and science and technology, which produces all these bombs and all these missiles and all these submarines and all these ICBMs. But at the same time, there's so much going on, so much information that the people can't digest it. Not only can the ordinary people not digest it, 
Their leaders can't digest it. And I question whether even the people in the White House can digest it. Because if they did, they'd talk about it more and there'd be more expression. But there's virtual silence in the face of impending horror. That's just the way it is. And having said that, I realize almost no one will be able to hear it. And if they hear it, they won't be able to repeat it because people will call them a kook. That puts it kind of the way I feel about it. I mean, to, to, you know, even in bringing it back to, to John Hersey and his original reporting, I mean, two of the things he was, he was um, you know, concerned about from the get go was, you know, what happens when the, when the actual loss of um, memory about what happened at Hiroshima um, takes place. You know, we're now many generations removed, you know, the last of the blast survivors are, are dying off and, you know, fewer people are really familiar with the narrative of, you know, or, or the narrative explaining this is what it was like to be, um, you know, a, a, un, under nuclear attack and the, the absolute horrific portrait of it. I mean, and, and so Hersey worried, you know, even, you know, very quickly after he, he first wrote his account, what would happen when, when that memory went away? It would, it would lose its potency as a deterrence. And I would argue that, um, you know, as famous as Hersey's work remains, that the memory has faded and it is losing its potency um, as a deterrent, especially, you know, among, you know, leadership. Um, and he also worried, Governor, as you were, were talking about, about slippage, what he called slippage, you know, again, the, the, the mistake and, uh, you know, are we under attack when we're not under attack? There's, a, you know, some kind of a technical malfunction, you know, disinformation environment, um, you know, and you, as you and I have talked about before, I mean, the only way to counter that is to increase dialogue, to have, you know, outlets where you can um, stand back and say, no, we're not under attack or, you know, to have preventative, remain in preventative treaties and keep um, channels of communication open. And unfortunately, those are deteriorating at the moment. Yeah, the, the problem is that every day that we get past uh, 1945 and the memory of Hiroshima, uh, we feel, oh my goodness, having all these nuclear weapons have prevented a nuclear war. And so we are drawing the conclusion that every day uh, the deterrent effect of our thousands of missiles uh, is stronger than ever. Uh, not stronger so much that we don't want to spend a couple of trillion to augment it. But there it is. Every day delivers the absolutely wrong lesson. Every day makes it more likely that we're going to get closer uh, to doomsday. And that's why the, the doomsday clock of the bulletin of atomic scientists is only 100 seconds uh, to midnight, to doomsday, because uh, the probability may be low that we'll have a nuclear accident or mistake. But every year, that probability continues. And if you have a 1% probability for long enough, then the 1% is going to occur and it will happen. So that's the urgency of each moment as we get further from Hiroshima. And I think this book, uh, people listening ought to get it and read it because it recaptures the moment when, when children are pasted, their, their shadow is pasted up against the wall. And I, I think about that image uh, when... I, I remember uh, Harry Truman saying he never lost a moment of sleep over dropping the atomic bomb. And if that's true, he never thought, he didn't read Hershey's book and he didn't uh, think about what the reality is. You have to be desensitized. And that happens in war when uh, people just mow down uh, children, women, uh, soldiers, whatever. You have to become desensitized. And uh, the leadership is desensitized right now. And books... Okay that can graphically recapture the moment uh, are absolutely critical. And Leslie, I hope you get to the bestseller list. <laughs> and Leslie, I, just picking up, up on that, the governor said something really interesting that I think feeds right into something I know you're thinking about, which is he talked about you have to be desensitized to, to uh, the, the killing of women and children and soldiers. Um, and you've been thinking a lot about that distinction between uh, civilian and non-civilian in the context of nuclear weapons and what that means for today. Do you want to bring our audience up to speed on, on what you've been thinking through and, uh, since writing that the, as, as you wrote the book and especially now? Well, I think, look, I mean, something that the governor and I have, have discussed is, you know, World War II as, as the moment when, you know, it, it became okay, like it, it was okay to, to kill civilians as collateral damage. All of a sudden, I mean, look in Hiroshima, 
it's been estimated that 90 percent, you know, even though it was designated a military target and there was some military value to the target, um, 90 percent of those killed were civilians and only 10 percent were, were uh, Japanese, Japanese military. Um, and, you know, it, it, World War II was the moment when we had 45 million civilians killed and 15 million combatants. And that's a conservative estimate. It has been estimated by the World War II Museum here in the States that there may have been as many as 50 million killed in China alone. We just won't know the answer to that. So, I mean, that shows that this is the moment in which it's okay to target civilian populations or at least be indifferent to, uh, to you know, the, the, the massacre of said populations. Um, you know, and there, there are disturbing trends over the, over the last few years that show that there is, I wouldn't want to call it an appetite, um, but there is a, a willingness to tolerate civilian casualties yet again. And so, you know, we've had a couple of studies that were, were featured on the bulletin uh, uh, of the atomic scientists that showed that um, as recently as last year, one third of the Americans who were surveyed in this one particular survey stated that they would support a preemptive nuclear attack on North Korea, even if it meant that one, one million civil, um, enemy civilians would die. Um, there have been other comparable studies, you know, geared towards, you know, Iran. Um, and again, the, the indifference towards these, uh, the, the, the indifference of the attitudes is a really disturbing trend because what it does is it, it, it enables, increasingly enables the use of nuclear weapons. Um, they're, they're more seemingly bloodless somehow than, than invasion. I mean, they're, they're more of a conception and, you know, this dehumanization of the, of the civilian enemies that would be targeted is, again, an extremely rattling, rattling trend. Um, and, you know, it's been interesting writing about, about the subject for various op-eds and seeing how different, different audiences respond. And um, it's been astonishing to me how in certain conservative communities, the attitude towards Hiroshima, um, uh, the bombing of Hiroshima, which has, would, would by, now by international legal stand, law standards be considered um, uh, illegal. Um, it's amazing how many people still believe that the Japanese civilians got what they deserved. Governor, there's a yeah, question what? from, from yeah. uh, those listening that I know is right up your alley and something you think a lot about. The, the question is, how possible is a nuclear misstep on our end as well as with other countries? I think getting at, should, should we be focusing on a bolt from the blue or something else? Well, the bolt from the blue is a graphic way of talking about all of a sudden the Russians launch an attack and take out all our ICBMs. And then uh, we're supposed to retaliate and complete the destruction of civilization. Uh, that's the theory. And don't you do anything to us because we'll end civilization with you if you do. So the whole business of the nuclear competition is insane. It's, they're not insane clinically, uh, because they, you know, they read the paper in the morning, they talk to their wives and talk to the press. But in fact, any kind of system that depends on this business, our protection, our lifeblood of protection is the threat to extinguish civilization. That's what it is. Now, the alternative, of course, is to get a serious dialogue uh, at disarmament and getting at least these nuclear weapons down to a very low level, uh, at least as our, as our next step. And Nobody's doing that. They're not worried. This is what gets me. They're, nobody, they're not worried about it. But uh, there we are. Now, the bolt of the blue, the bolt out of the blue is what said, uh, what do we do about that? To prevent Russia from attacking first, we're going to keep building so many new missiles, so flexible, so exotic that they wouldn't dare. Now, the, while we build these exotic technologies, uh, we forget the fact or at least we don't focus on it at the level we need to, that the more exotic the technology, the greater the probability that it will fail. Uh, complexity uh, of these technologies mean you can't know every single detail in the total, total system 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, forever. And therefore, the chance of a misfire uh, becomes uh, almost certain. In fact, it does become certain uh, if you give it enough time. So the only question is, 
Do we blow up our own civilization or do we contemplate, uh, contemplate uh, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren? Whenever it comes, uh, it's a horror that we ought to prevent. And the current system of uh, tit for tat, Russia builds the system, we build. Uh, they build, we build. Uh, going back and forth, upscaling the deterrent posture at ever higher levels of lethality. That's what we're doing. And the more the lethality grows, the more the threat of horror grows, the more scared we get. And the only thing we know how to do with our fear is to build more nuclear weapons. And that's why if you look at the Congress, uh, the Democratic Party, the so-called socialists are uh, voting for massive, massive nuclear overkill this week, there, it's going on. So uh, folks listening, uh, you know, ask questions, but uh, please talk to your friends, talk to your congressmen. If you know any big shots, talk to them uh, because it's really sleepy time in the USA. And by the way, in Russia and in China and in India and in Pakistan and these other countries, they don't seem to, they don't seem to get it. And maybe that's our biggest problem. How could we know and all these other people not know? Well, that's the truth. I'm sorry. That's what Bill Perry says. Uh, that's what George Schultz says. Uh, even that's what Henry Kissinger says. Sam Nunn. There are credible people who believe what I just said. So there it is. So in order to get... Oh, I was going to say, you know, I mean, in order to get, you know, our, our Congress to to care about these things, they have to know that we care about them. And again, I don't know how many people of my generation are thinking about nu nukes at all. I mean, I, I'm a child of the 80s, um, you know, so, you know, I grew up in a very different environment where, you know, the, the threat of nuclear annihilation was really quite high on everybody's mind. I remember, you know, one of the first... You know, letters I ever wrote was to one to Ronald Reagan and one to Gorbachev, you know, as, a, as an eight-year-old, because I was terrified of, of uh, you know, uh, nuclear winter. Um, but, you know, the younger demographic today just is, is, I mean, how many people among them knows about, you know, mutually assured destruction? Um, and so it just, the, the awareness just needs to be considerably raised and the pressure needs to, to be put on. And, uh, you know, our, our representatives need to know that the, these are deadly important issues that are cared about, you know, through all different age demographics. So let me pick up on that. And I just want to push, push you on that because they're, yeah, because you're out talking uh, to groups like this. Um, so in a sense, you're, you're doing regular public opinion surveys. Um, we at the Bulletin have seen a wild growth in our audience. Um, and half of our audience is younger than 35 years old. So from where I sit, we're actually seeing growing interest. And it's front page news, the U.S., North Korean struggles, Iran before that. Uh, maybe not in the way it had been in the past, uh, but there seems a growing awareness. M my, my sense is that there may be this awareness out there, but a lack of a sense of what to do about it. So this actually ties back to Hersey and, and the op-ed that you wrote for uh, the Wall Street Journal, um, where uh, you quote that, that in Hersey's time, like now, I think, there was a sense of atrocity exhaustion, um, and and you quote, you know, a clinical casualty, a clinic, clinical casualty statistics can be numbing, and I wonder, is it, is it that people aren't thinking about it, or is it that we have kind of atrocity exhaustion, right? Just with the climate change and the pandemic in the U.S. school shootings, like kids are dealing with existential issues in a way that in the 90s they weren't in, in yeah. it, right that there was that but it's different now but on the nuclear issue and i think there's answers to this but on the nuclear issue it's less clear what one can do about it for a pandemic you can stay inside for yeah. climate change you can recycle and turn off lights in addition to all the other things drive less right there's but on the nuclear so can you talk us through the uh, is it is it that people don't care? Is it that people care, but we're not sure what to do about it? What's your sense out there uh, in terms of, of the public? And then Governor Brown, you too, you're out speaking about this all the time. I'd love your thoughts on that question too. But Leslie, maybe you can take a crack at that. 
Well, I think, you know, what, what you're saying is right. I mean, look, for, you know, for, for Gen X and for the generations that are coming up behind, I mean, what a nice mess has been left for them. I mean, they are dealing with climate change. They are dealing with pandemic right now. And then this is one more thing that they're meant to stare down. And, you know, this is their legacy. I mean, it hasn't been solved in, in 75 years um, and, and, you know, continues only to, to accelerate in a dangerous direction. I mean, the bandwidth is, um, is you know, really quite slim right now. Um, but, you know, as you, as you mentioned, in 1945, there was a comparable level of exhaustion because this was a worldwide population that had just, you know, witnessed and gone through the deadliest conflict in human history. I mean, they were absolutely exhausted from what they had seen from having been privy to the worst in human nature from the, the task of having to rebuild. Um, and, but the fact is, is that, you know, exhaustion wasn't an option then. And it's not an exa- it's it's not an option now. I mean, we have to find you know a, a way to to confront um, the, the dangers that 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 um, and that, that uh, confront us. And you know, there are you know, it really does come down to in many ways um, activism and elections. I mean, you have to be again, it just has to be made an election issue. Representatives, you know, in their campaigns need to know. That um, that younger voters um, see this as a very serious and you know if not the most serious existential threat saving us because you know once such slippage occurs as we've been describing earlier in this program that's it for civilization in a matter of minutes you know climate change it's it, it's remaking the world violently but gradually I mean this this is the existential threat that wipes out the entire history of human uh, achievement in in a matter of minutes so you know, it's it's about you know, making sure that you are electing a responsible leadership, keeping it as, you know, prominent election and campaign issues, and then um, activism. And, you know, many of the leaders with whom, you know, I spoke for when I was researching Fallout, um, many of them had been inspired to become uh, activists, you know, advocating for sane nuclear policies and for dialogue over the last, um, you know, 50, 60 years, um, partly because they truly understood what it was like what nuclear war- warfare really looked like, and again, that all comes back to to John Hersey and showing, you know, this is this is what happens um, when you have dehumanized another population enough to attack it with nuclear weapons, and this is what what may happen, um, you know, to your city or to your family or you know your your community if there is if there are hostilities or if there is, God forbid, a mistake in the technology. The problem we face, a number of problems. One is, this is kind of a, a zero-sum on-off uh, kind of reality. And it's off right now. There's no bomb. And when it comes on, you're not going to get a lot of warning. There's not going to be a lot of buildup. Uh, that's why it makes it hard uh, mm-hmm. to even imagine. Uh, even uh, we mitigate some of our fears, for example, with the uh, ballistic missile defenses of which America has spent $300 million on to date since Reagan first came up with the Star Wars uh, kind, of, kind of idea. And according to the scientists that I've talked to, there's no way the defense can stop a determined uh, offensive assault. And so, but this false god of a nuclear shield or nuclear defense uh, has captured the imagination of key uh, elite people in America. So uh, we're going for the uh, defense shield, we know it has plenty of holes in it, and the only response that Putin or the China is going to make is to build more weapon systems, so no matter what our defense is, they can overwhelm them at a lower cost. And Russia today is building five new uh, nuclear weapon systems that uh, validate the very point I'm making. So, But the idea that we should just be mutually vulnerable uh, is very distasteful, if not unthinkable. We used to be mutually vulnerable. Well, uh, that idea is quite alien. We don't think the world is mutually vulnerable to the pandemic or to climate or or to nuclear. And we've got to get a more planetary uh, consciousness here where we realize we're in the same boat. We're on the same planet. We're subject to the same uh, threats, which nuclear is certainly the most catastrophic, but shrouded in utter complexity and Given the state of our democracy, uh, elite opinion and uh, the media, uh, the press, as we've been talking about, depends on clicks, on eyeballs. Eyeballs mean money. Money means survival. There's not a lot of eyeballs 
uh, reaching for nuclear stories. So it's going to take some uh, leadership in both the media, the political, the academic, uh, the literary world uh, to wake us up. And I would say this book, Leslie, is a uh, is the kind of step that we got to make. We need like a thousand uh, of these efforts, some books, some meetings, some conferences, uh, whatever. And that's not happened yet. So we got to, if I may use the wrong metaphor, light a fire under people. We got to got to wake them up and visualization of, of what is at stake. And I think having Mr. Trump on the button when the false alert comes, oh, there's 200 missiles coming from Russia. Uh, Mr. President, you have 15 minutes uh, to order uh, a, res a response. If we don't fire before the missiles get here, we lose all our ICBMs. The logic becomes um, overwhelming. Uh, maybe Trump pushes the button, maybe he doesn't. But we shouldn't depend on such a, 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 a human being, one man, one finger, uh, holding civilization in his hands. That's crazy. And why we can't wake up people, uh, I hope the people listening can reflect on that very fact that if you think what we're saying uh, makes sense, why doesn't it make sense to anybody else? That is the question. You know, I've, since re since starting to research this book, I've been thinking a lot about the role of warnings in in the press and in popular culture. And uh, you know, in in Hersey's time, Hersey was not the first journalist to make a run at telling the story of Hiroshima and you know telling the story of what it was like to. Um, you know, to be under nuclear attack and, you know, what the human toll of it was. And, you know, the first journalist to get in on the ground um, in Hiroshima was a, uh, or the second was a, an Australian um, journalist called Wilfred Burchett. And literally his um, article that, that ran in the London Express just a few weeks after Hiroshima's bombing was, it said, atomic plague in all caps. And it gave an extremely visual um, and graphic um, a description of, of what Hiroshima looked like and the sinister quote disease X that was ravaging blast survivors then. And underneath, you know, the, 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 the subtitle was this is my warning to the world. And there have been relentless such warnings to the world since the earliest days after Hiroshima's bombing. And, um, you know, the, the, nobody seems to, to be heeding them properly. You know, and again, bringing this back to the, the current climate, it's the same thing for pandemic. How sexy was the topic of pandemic for the press before we were all in lockdown? Um, you know, and so you know there were vast warnings from communities that documented um, the pandemic as as an existential threat, existential global threat. Um, you know, we're we're having the kinds of sessions that we're having now, trying to draw attention to that. And it's not until it's in an emergency situation where suddenly the topic becomes sexy and the warning actually takes root. Well, guess what? In nuclear situations, you don't have six months or a year to figure it out. You have, as you say, 15 minutes. And so I, I really truly hope that, again, that we can um, help to, to wake up the, the population to the fact that these nuclear issues in the nuclear landscape must become extremely prominent in this election and, and afterwards. So there's a question, there's several questions um, from, from those joining us today, um, but here's one. The US government intentionally prevented people from seeing in color the effects of nuclear bombs. How do we get these stories heard in this time of disinformation on social media? And um, Leslie, I'd love for you to put your journalism hat on to answer that, that, that it was hard enough for Hersey, but in today's uh, m moment of disinformation even harder and governor your political hat on how do you manage this in a in a moment of, of such extreme disinformation Leslie you want to take a shot at that one first well I mean I get asked a lot you know could um, you know could there have been a Hiroshima cover-up today and you know it's it probably not to the extent that there was. I mean, the occupation forces were able to, to cover up significantly and repress the Japanese press, but they didn't have, you know, the civilians and survivors didn't have camera phones. Today we do. You know, so um, it would have been a lot harder to suppress the extent of, of, of the aftermath. Um, 
And, you know, I've also thought a lot about, you know, what if a comp if Hersey's report had come out today, you know, there was a significant, you know, one, th one third or 40 percent of the population would have conveniently um, dismissed it as fake news. Um, how do you get around that? I don't I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think that, you know, you there are reputable news sources, there are reputable leg legacy news sources. And, um, you know, for me, coming up as a as a journalist trained in the newsrooms of you know uh, Cronkite Productions and and you know Ted Ted Koppel's newsrooms, you you have a, a sense of you know which which news sources are fact checked, you know which uh, source you know which news sources um, have a particular culture of reporting that borders on what we call the the, the terror of error, um, you know where you you. you it's you, you, you are just, it's a responsible news outlet. Um, and so I would, you know, just really argue that don't get your news through Facebook, through, you know, through dubious sources and to, to really continue to rely on legacy news sources. And, and, um, but, you know, I also, you know, the, the challenge of reducing the number of people who are uh, getting their news from from Facebook and from dubious news sources. I don't know what the answer to, the, to that is. I don't know how you wean them. I don't know how you reverse the trend. Um, all I know is that there is a considerable press corps who, um, you know, are deeply devoted to, to truth, to truth telling, and to um, getting the facts out to, uh, to the general public so they can make decisions on their own behalf. Well, the, the news people depend on news, and there's not much news being made about the nuclear danger. So it's going to take, uh, I believe, it's going to take some uh, senator, well, hopefully a congressman, a group of them, that get on this as their one issue and keep pounding it, pounding it, pounding it. Uh, there was a guy in, in uh, the Roman Republic called Cato the Elder. And Cato the Elder was a senator. He sat in the back of the Roman Senate. And after every speech, he would pound on the table and say, Carthage must be destroyed. Carthago delendum est. He said that all the time. We need someone in the Senate after every speech to say the bomb must be stopped or something equivalent. And we don't have that. Uh, so we do need uh, a, a new Cato in our Senate. To, to save us. And outside, we need, uh, like Greta, or uh, we need Leslie. We need people who start the, 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 the debate, who, who speak, who make news. And uh, I think that can creep out. And people who fear Trump uh, should think about uh, how would you like it if Trump has 15 minutes to decide on uh, firing weapons that will end your life. And it won't be pleasant. You're going to melt. You're going to melt to death if you, if you, if you know it. A horror. Okay, so you Trump supporters, uh, however many are listening, how would you like some socialist, some liberal that you think the Democratic Party is? They're going to have their hand on the uh, on the button. That should make you uncomfortable too. So no matter if you're on the right or the left, Trump, anti-Trump, this is a universal uh, uh, threat that intelligent people should be able to see, to perceive, to realize, and then react. So we need some newsmakers. Uh, thank you, Commonwealth Club, for this discussion. But we need th a thousand more as, as soon as possible. I think I agree, Governor. I agree that that actually is a, a really um, difficult challenge in terms of media coverage. And, and you know, it, it's you, news isn't something unless it's already happened. It, it, and I think that that's a part, you know, so anticipatory news events are, are difficult to get coverage, especially when there are so many literal fires burning right now. Um, and so, for instance, uh, when I was in Japan researching researching this book, um, I came across a, a, a story about, um, you know, the storage of uh, Fukushima's dirty water and, you know, what, what the danger that it's in. You know, we are, you know, potentially one earthquake or tsunami away from having that wash into the Pacific. Now, I personally found that an incredibly alarming story. Um, I brought that to many major news outlets who had the capacity to report on that. Um, and nobody picked that story up because it was it, it hadn't happened yet. It's like they would report on it if the water, you know, if there had been some kind of an accident and the stored um, contaminated water at Fukushima had already 
had gone into the Pacific, but the fact that it was endangered wasn't a sexy news story. So it, it, to the best of my knowledge, it really hasn't been covered in, in the in the last 18 months since I since I um, first brought it to, to outlets. Um, so I, I agree that um, it, it's it, the media's responsibility to flag the danger. And again, it comes back to my question of, of warnings and 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 um, how warnings are presented to the public and how how do you get the public to heed warnings? Well, part of that is uh, really having the message brought you know brought home through through media and you know not just in terms of things that have happened already because you know coverage of post nuclear apocalypse is going to be thin to say the least. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, in terms of, of of highlighting, you know, grave existential dangers, and hopefully we've learned partly our lesson through through ignoring the existential threat of pandemic. You know, we might start by having the president or the presidential candidates uh, at least repeat the Reagan-Gorbachev statement that a nuclear war uh, can never be won and must never be fought. I don't mm -hmm. believe, and hopefully a listener will be able to confirm it, or uh, refute uh, that Obama uh, repeated that statement, or Clinton, or George Bush, uh, or, or Trump, or, or Biden. Uh, somehow, uh, just to say that a, a nuclear war may never be fought is verboten. Taboo, you can't say that. Because if you really said it and repeated it, you would not be spending uh, a couple of trillion uh, fixing up our nuclear arsenal. At the very least, you'd want to have a scaled down version because it, the, the civilization can be ended for a lot less than a trillion. It really is only going to yeah. cost, you know, tens of, tens of millions, maybe a couple hundred million. We can have enough weapons uh, both to scare the Russians. And if the Russians don't bite, but they bomb us, then we can fire back and end civilization. Uh, we don't have to spend our money now uh, when we can do it so much cheaper. And I say that somewhat ironically, because if people could understand a nuclear war can, can't be won, they can ask the question, why can't it be won? And if you ask the question, why can't it be won, then you'll understand uh, what this uh, conversation has been all about. And that's why a nuclear is so unique. And when Trump uh, said, What's a new, what are nuclear bombs good for if you don't use them? He was expressing uh, the fallacy that nuclear weapons are just weapons. No, they're the means of extinction of civilization. If not civilization, then just America or the 20th century style. We could maybe go back to uh, radioactive cavemen or something. But that, which I'm saying uh, in kind of a ghoulish way, uh, somehow can't be talked about. And yet I think it has to be. And we've got to get that word out in a simple step. Let the Reagan-Gorbachev formula be embraced. I wanted to put that in the Democratic platform uh, but was un unsuccessful in attempting to do that. So that is not a big step, but I think it will at least put the matter uh, before the American people. And uh, then people should ask the question, well, why can't it be fought? And why can't a nuclear war be won? And if you just go down that road, uh, you will, you will uh, uncover all the things that we're talking about and a lot more. Well, I think just in terms of the extraordinary amount of money that's being invested right now to update systems, I mean, the fact is, as you say, I mean, we, we do, it is within our means to destroy civilization right now. We have 13,500 warheads right now, which isn't, you know, certainly isn't peak. It's It's been reduced, you know, considerably from previous stockpiles, but it's there. And look, you know, when, when Hersey wrote about um, the, the bomb that detonated over Hiroshima, it was only, you know, 12 months after um, after that bomb had, had destroyed that city and uh, tens of thousands of, of, of humans. Um, but that was already considered a primitive bomb even then. I mean, work was already um, you know, well underway on what would later be called the hell bomb and thermonuclear weapons. So the fact is, is that even the very, very first primitive bomb that was used in warfare, you know, if there had been enough of, 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 of that manufacturer that, that could have portended, you know, the, the end. Um, so, yes, we, we, already, we already are there. Um, and, you know, the, the escalation of, of systems and, and weapons is, um, 
it just reminds me of a quote that Alfred, uh, Albert Einstein said uh, around the time that Hersey's report came out. He was asked about what World War III would look like, and he, he turned around and he said, I don't know what World War III looks like, but I can tell you what World War IV looks like and what they'll be using to fight it, and it will be rocks. Yeah, well, there it is. Um, I think, I think what, one, one of the, the questions... Big, one of the big barriers... I, I don't want to just get this in. Uh, one of the big uh, fundamental building blocks of nuclear insanity is the concept of deterrence. Uh, deterrence is a big umbrella word uh, that it covers a lot. And so when you say we strengthen deterrence, you mean you spend a trillion modernizing your nuclear weapons. You build a new system. You build a flexible system. You build uh, submarines with little nuclear, big nuclear, middle size. Deterrence is uh, what uh, says we threaten. That's what I deter. I threaten you. I don't hit you, but I promise to hit you. And I promise to hit you with ever more lethal weapons. And as we threaten more, the other side threatens more. And when we have these exchange of threats, we get more anxious. And when we get more anxious, we say we've got to strengthen deterrence, which means to build more and more lethal and dangerous weapons. And the only thing that will stop it, there's only two things that will stop it. Either it goes off and we create absolute catastrophe or the Russians and the Americans and ultimately the Chinese to come to a place where we can uh, trust or we can build that level of confidence, which after all, Richard Nixon, people used to call him Tricky Dick. He went over there with his wife, Pat, and they stayed all night in the Kremlin. And with Kissinger, they stayed up drinking and talking with Brezhnev, and they came out with some understandings that led to detente. And then, of course, Dayton got blew up under Reagan, and then Reagan got tired of being the, the warrior, and he got with Gorbachev. Gorbachev, they all worked out nuclear war can't be fought. And then you go a few more years, and we're back to where we were uh, at the end of Nixon's time. The taunt has been blown up. We, gotta, we hate the Russians because they're so bad. We hate the Chinese, the Iranians, the Koreans. They're all bad. But here at home, what do we read about? Black lives uh, uh, have been oppressed. Uh, there's horrors. The, uh, of unfairness and ruining lives and shooting people in the back. Well, look, be humble. We've got flaws. They're different than Russian flaws, but whatever the flaws in America or Russia, they're nothing to the horror of a nuclear war. So why can't human beings sit down and at least solve that problem so we can work on all these other ones? So let me just pick up on this because there is a question that came in from one of uh, one of our people joining us today about the role of the United Nations and is there anything the United Nations can do? And as we we're sitting here across my screen, the newest article from the New Yorker popped through, and it's interestingly is it's entitled "Is Russian Meddling as Dangerous as We Think?" Uh, leading to, in some ways, yes. But um, we've got this really difficult moment where there's a lot of attention on the tension between the U.S. and the Russians, the Russian meddling in our elections as we're coming into an election at a time where the nuclear threat is significant and we need to be sitting down with the Russians, the U.S. and the Russians control 90% of the world's nuclear weapons. Those are the two parties that need to be at the table in February, the last remaining U.S.-Russian arms control agreement, New START, uh, goes away and we'll have nothing left in terms of anything mediating between the two countries. And so um, my question for, for you, Governor Brown, in particular on this is how can we sit down with the Russians at this moment? How do you advocate for that? You and I were on Capitol Hill a couple of years ago, kind of talking through some of these issues about recognizing the, the adversarial role at the moment between the U.S. and Russia, and yet the need to, to try to come to the table or advance new kinds of uh, treaties or arms control uh, arrangements. What do, you, what do you think about that? Well, uh, look, we, 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 we have to get off this Russia obsession. Granting everything uh, people say about Russia and their interference. Uh, Russia interference for the entire year of 2016 is nothing to what James Comey did in five minutes. His, re his reopening the investigation on Hillary's email, which was a complete empty, it, it went nowhere, and he didn't have to do it. That one act uh, probably, we can never be sure, moved more votes than whatever Putin or Putin's friends or oligarchs did through social media. And I would argue that uh, uh, Fox News 
that Hannity and the disinformation and also from Trump himself uh, in a week uh, does more than the Russians have done in their uh, disinformation in years. But whatever it is, whatever the flaws are, uh, we they're nothing compared to the value of an honest uh, dialogue where we talk about uh, getting the nuclear genie back into the bottle, or at least controlling it far more than we're doing now. Now it's expansion. Now there's talk about uh, more nuclear uh, testing. Uh, now there's all these new weapon systems. China has only 400 nuclear nukes. They're getting ready to build up. Uh, they're on that path now. Russia's on that path. America's on that path. India, Pakistan in their own way. It's collective madness. So I think we should stop looking at the flaws, the sins, the evils of the other guy. We should reflect on our own uh, problems and evils, recognize that humankind is deeply flawed. I mean, just take the war in Iraq. How many hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children have been killed and suffered excruciating torment because of that uh, decision by Bush to go in there and bomb, uh, not having any credible evidence that there were uh, weapons of mass destruction. Even if there were, there were other ways to handle it. So look, there's plenty on all sides, but let's assume America's perfect and uh, Russia is really deeply evil. Even granting that, we can still talk to the Russians in the way Nixon talked to them, Kissinger talked to them, Kennedy talked, uh, Obama did that. Uh, we could do all that. Uh, even Bush, Bush uh, Jr. got along with Putin, at least for a while. We got to translate that into viable uh, nuclear reductions and controls. That's what we need to do. And we, and we can talk all we want about the, the hot issues. And you know what they are, I can't mention them because they're so hot that if you minimize them, you become a heretic. But I want to say, no matter what you read in the paper the last year, nothing equals a nuclear mistake, which we are getting more likely to have every day. So let's handle all these other problems. They're damn serious. But let's not forget the biggest problem of all, the one we're talking about. Leslie, her, I was struck in your book, um, and then we'll, begin, we'll we'll turn to last thoughts on this. But before, I was really struck in your book about um, how the Japanese, the Americans, and the Russians were not terribly interested in talking about the effects of of the bomb, and I, and that each of them had their own reason for not addressing these issues. I think there's some implications for today, but will you share that story with us and, and then we'll go to our closing thoughts. Well, I mean, the Japanese couldn't talk about the, the effects of the bomb because they were under a press code imposed by uh, General MacArthur's occupation forces. I mean, they couldn't even mention um, Hiroshima and uh, the aftermath in a poem, much less a press report. So there's that. The uh, U.S. government um, it enacted uh, an, an elaborate uh, cover-up and suppression of the, the realities of the bomb, um, partly because uh, they were worried about, um, as uh, the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, put it, being seen as, quote, having outdone Hitler in atrocities. Um, and so uh, if the truth were known about um, the true aftermath, radioactive aftermath um, of, of the then experimental weapons that the U.S. had used on this largely civil uh, civilian population that it might qualify the, the, the morality of the hard-earned military victory. Um, and so that uh, that suppression of information about the reality of uh, you know what nuclear weapons really did to human beings went on for for more than a year until John Hersey's report came out in the New Yorker in August of 1946. The Russians enacted a, a, a Hiroshima cover-up of their own, and the Russians actually interestingly had gotten into Hiroshima before the Americans to examine the, the aftermath there. They were in 10 days after uh, Hiroshima had been bombed, and when they left, they took you know rubble samples, they took photographs, they even took human remains with them for analysis, and the Soviet leadership knew um, early on, you know, the, how horrific the the um, it had been to be on again the receiving end of nuclear warfare. That said, their their former wartime ally, the U.S., now had the nuclear monopoly, and uh, the Russians would not have um, the bomb for another four years. And so, Hersey's Hiroshima and information about. Um, about uh, the true aftermath in Hiroshima, if it 
got out within you know, the Soviet Union, it was see, it was seen as a threat to them. In in a way, you know, the Soviet leadership felt that the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki had not been directed so much at Japan, but as the Soviet Union to show them, quote, who uh, you know the U.S. is is boss. And so uh, they reduced the amount of information that could about the the U.S.'s new mega weapons. Um, lest they, uh, lest their population feel that they were, you know, at a, a significant disadvantage, which they were until 1949. So we're coming to the end of our time, and I want to give you each the opportunity um, for for uh, one last thought, Governor Brown. What haven't we talked about today that that we should, or what would you like to make sure we we emphasize well, before we I, go out? I want to talk about something we haven't talked about, and I. I don't in any way minimize the, the, the danger in the world uh, that, of, that we face. We have too many wars through history to, tell, to let us have a Pollyanna point of view. We have to be wary and on guard. But we also ought to recognize that there's an aspect of racket, a racket to this, to this nuclear arms race. Because the promise of building more nuclear weapons and making them all spiffy and modernized is that we're somehow uh, gonna slow down the arms race or make us safer. The only people who win by this are Boeing and Northrop and all the other people getting the general dynamics, getting billions of dollars. Uh, no matter what happens, they win. And when we build a new system, we know as night follows day, that the Russians and later, and then certainly then the Chinese are going to build a similar, not completely similar, but they're going to counter with another system. And then as sure as uh, day follows night, America is going to build a system to counter the system that was meant to counter the one we had. And on and on up the escalation ladder goes until it blows up, unless we can get off what has become a nuclear addiction fed by billions of dollars and don't think they don't have lobbyists and don't think they're not influencing campaigns. They're there camped in Washington and even as we speak are making friends and making sure that uh, America does not ever get off uh, this horrible uh, nuclear arms race. That's what people have to see. There are people who are getting rich out of the, the threat increasing of, of such uh, monumental destruction and that needs to be exposed and journalists can certainly bring that about. Follow the money. Leslie, last thoughts from you. Again, I just keep returning to the, the idea that nuclear warfare is the, the most strangely forgotten existential threat in the moment. And it is not acceptable. Again, this must become a campaign issue. It must be a leadership issue. Then we must have more activists on the issue. And, you know, again, I know everybody's exhausted right now, but willful ignorance on this subject is not an option and our exhaustion is not an option. We have to find it in ourselves to stand up and confront this issue and to educate ourselves on it and to take action on it. Because otherwise, again, as Einstein said, the fourth world war will be fought with rocks. Well, my thanks to former California Governor Jerry Brown and Leslie Bloom, author of the new book, Fallout, the Hiroshima cover-up and the reporter who revealed it to the world. I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for joining us today and participating live. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org. I'm Rachel Bronson. Thank you and stay safe, everyone. <laughs>